So good morning, everyone, or good uh, afternoon or good evening, depending on where uh, on where you are. Thanks for joining uh, today for this uh, second day of the Startup and Angels uh, FinTech uh, online uh, event. Uh, really happy to have you uh, today uh, and with an amazing uh, panel of uh, speakers. So we'll speak about uh, international uh, FinTech uh, startups, early stage startups with founders and investors in the room as well. Um, uh, uh, so we have a three-day event uh, this week. Uh, yesterday was about uh, uh, more the, the trends of the uh, fintech industry. Today with early stage uh, startups and tomorrow with uh, uh, later stage uh, startups that we call uh, scale-ups. Um, so uh, feel free to ask questions on the chat room. Uh, we will have three parts uh, during this uh, event today. Uh, first, an intro with the different speakers. Secondly, uh, we'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll have a, a networking uh, breakout rooms where we can uh, introduce yourself and uh, know a bit more uh, each other. Um, so that's the that's the agenda. So we have uh, uh, speakers today. We'll have uh, Mike from uh, Nona, uh, live from uh, Adelaide. Hi, Mike. Uh, Caroline from Clever uh, in Sydney. Lucas uh, from uh, Spain in the Asturias. Uh, Matthias from uh, Paris, but uh, with his startup from uh, Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. And Martin from uh, Singapore. Uh, a quick one about uh, Startup and Angels. So uh, um, originally before the pandemic, we were organizing uh, mostly uh, uh, or only uh, live events. So we've been organizing about uh, uh, 50 plus events before that uh, in the APAC region and a bit of uh, in some countries in Africa for about uh, five years with uh, thousands and of attendees and uh, hundreds of speakers. Uh, and now, uh, due to the, uh, the last two years, uh, we've been organizing more of these online events, uh, once again, trying to uh, uh, connect everyone around different topics, uh, industries, uh, or market. A uh, quick word from uh, Leo, my uh, co-founder here on the Startup and Angel. Hi, Leo. Hi, everyone. Uh, and thank Excel for, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm the co-founder of Startup and Angels with Axel, founder of Australians. Basically, Australians, we're here to uh, help uh, you know, startups, international scale-ups with their growth uh, in APAC uh, or in Europe. Uh, we provide a range of, uh, of solutions. Uh, basically, our motto is really to create uh, value through meaningful connections. And you know, very happy to uh, you know, discuss with you uh, one-on-one your projects and how we can support uh, I hope you all enjoyed the, the event. A big thanks to uh, you know, all our partners, um, Axel and team for putting it together. See you shortly. And thanks, as Leo said, uh, to uh, our partners. So we have uh, various partners here that have been uh, uh, helping us to arrange these uh, online events and uh, to arrange the next uh, physical events in the months uh, to come. Um, without further ado, I'll uh, uh, give the... Uh, um, time to the speakers to introduce uh, themselves and we'll start with uh, Mike. Hi Mike, how are you? Hi Axel, thanks very much. Um, should I take over the screen sharing? Yeah, go for it. Cool, let me just quickly find the image. Uh, and while I'm finding that, I apologize if there is a lot of background noise. There's a massive thunderstorm in Adelaide, which is very uncharacteristic. So if you hear strange noises, that is the strange noise and which is coming into sydney right now so thanks for that yeah <laughs> so cool can you guys see the the fintech founder journey all good yeah cool so my name is mike scott um i wear two hats in the context of this call the first hat is i'm the co-founder and the ceo of nona digital um, and i'll explain that in a minute and then i'm also the host of the fintech founder journey which is what you're looking at on your screen we interview some of the world's leading fintech founders and we talk about their journey just as it says on the can um, Nona Digital is an expert firm. We're about 35 people, full-time employed people. We don't work with freelancers or outsourcers, and we essentially accelerate product development for growth stage fintech and blockchain companies. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll be moderating the panel just now, and I guess the lens that I come at this from is really through the lens of working with and interviewing a lot of fintech founders across the field. So my view is very micro, it's not macro at all. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about. So <clears throat> I was also asked to give 
in just a few minutes, which I'll do now, my, my take on the current trends in the fintech space that I'm seeing. And like I said, I'm, I'm not a KPMG or a Deloitte doing a, an overview. The lens that I want to just quickly share some stuff with you with is really just my experience of what we're seeing on a daily basis, both through the podcast and through the business. And it's, I thought about this a lot and, you know, I kind of made a joke in the prep when, you know, people say trends in fintech, it's kind of like buy now, pay later is everything. It's just all you hear about is buy now, pay later, right? That's, that's everything. But it's, it's not just that. I think that's just in the mainstream media now, mainly because of Square acquiring Afterpay for, for $38 billion. And then once the share price normalized, it turned out they actually didn't even pay for it, which is crazy. Monzo and Revolut recently announcing that they're going to be getting into the, the buy now, pay later space as well. This is pretty massive. So we've got some pretty huge signals in the market. Um, and this is not just in the developed country. This is across Africa. It's, it's, it's really exciting what's happening. Um, lots of debate around the ethics around that, but that's certainly a big trend. Second one is just cryptocurrency. So this continues to grow massively, but recently, most notably in the DeFi space, in the central bank digital currency space. And with this, we're still seeing a lot of uncertainty in the regulatory environments. Just literally, I think yesterday, Binance Singapore announced that basically you have to withdraw all of your tokens in the next very short space of time. So it's still a very tricky environment, um, but we're seeing massive adoption here. Forbes, I saw there was an article from Forbes today if you've got 32 of the world's 32 out of 100 of the world's largest companies are now giving positive sentiment on crypto. So 18 months ago, that list would have been zero or, or a handful. So there's massive movement, but still huge uncertainty. Um, I speak to a huge amount of fintech founders on literally a daily basis. And what I can tell you is that 100% of the founders that I'm speaking to in the fintech space are keeping a very close eye on the blockchain of crypto world if they're not already incorporating it in, in some way, shape or form. Um, so it's really exciting what's happening there. NFTs are a bit of a meme and quite fun, mm -hmm. but really the reason why I'm putting that in here now is I think there's gonna be very interesting movement on the NFT infrastructure play. I think NFTs are speculative and they're great or they're not, whatever you can think, whatever you want. But what's interesting about them is I think we're going to start seeing a big trend towards building proper and sophisticated infrastructure around the utility of the NFT space. Uh, embedded finance, we're seeing strong adoption um, with this kind of like everyone can become a fintech. Um, we're seeing huge investment, huge innovation. And, and I'm personally really excited about the embedded finance opportunity. So that's certainly a trend. And then payments, of course, and, and through, my, through my lens where I'm seeing the most movement in the payment space is still across border remittances. I literally spoke to a startup today. I mean, every other day, there seems to be someone coming up with some USP around cross border remittances because of the huge costs associated with it. Again, a lot of these are trying to utilize stable coins and, and digital currencies to facilitate these transactions with less friction. And then last but not least, open banking. I think open banking is really exciting. I'm, I, I'm seeing a lot of founders at the moment that have built businesses on open banking, which excites me because just a few years ago, those businesses just wouldn't have existed. So I think open banking is definitely on trend. It's really exciting. Um, and I'm certainly really pumped to be able to be in the space, both from the podcast host perspective and to be building for and with some of the biggest names in the world in the space on the fintech and the blockchain side. So that's a little bit about me and, and, and my lens into the world. Um, what I want to jump into now is we've got four great guests uh, on the panel, um, and I'd like them to just take just a couple of minutes to either give you a slide presentation or just to give you the elevator pitch on exactly what it is that they're all about, what they're doing, the problem they're solving, and why they're worth listening to. And I'd like to ask Caroline Tran to please start. So I will stop sharing my yeah. ugly mug. And it's That's a really you. nice recap, Mike. I feel like you just literally sum up this whole conversation in like literally less than two minutes. Well done. Like that's that's a great information. Like it's like the a lot of information that you know recap into like a few sentences is really nice and and really um great to be here, guys. Um and uh, my name is Caroline Tran. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Clever. So I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, so let me actually share with you some slides about Clever because I feel like I need to keep up with the momentum that we are doing here. So sorry, can you guys see my screen a little bit? It might be yeah, all good. a bit shadow. I don't know, let me see, because I was just running it on like a PDF file. Okay, so Clever. So Clever is basically a centralized you know, universal platform for Gen Z uh, that provides end-to-end -end solutions for money management, 
to payments um, solutions for, for the younger generations. Um, so we were, um, so we launched the product in the market in, in uh, August, 2021, and we're awarded with funds awards uh, last month with uh, Australian best uh, personal finance management app. I'm not sure what this is. Um, and we were part of Tokyo Financial Awards last year. We are also uh, were shortlisted for um, Visa uh, initiative everywhere this year as well on, on, on top five. Um, so let me put in the next slide. So yeah, in a nutshell, again, we are a super app for, for young people, um, you know, empowers the next generations really wanted to, you know, provide a centralized platform for them to manage money and provide payment solution as well. So yeah, the problem is really straightforward. Um, so we found that 64% of um, Aussies, you know, Gen Zs, um, constantly that have concerns over their finances. And, you know, 85% of them actually don't know how to do with their money. So therefore, you know, we, we come up with the real solutions, like what can we do to help them to have that centralized view over their, over their money? So we provide two solutions in the market at the moment. And, and I can talk into, you know, these in more detail later on, but basically we have Hello Clever, which is a product uh, on the consumer side that, you know, empower and super app that empower young generations. And another um, product, it's called Clever Pay, uh, which is a universal open banking payment platform using QR code um, for instant 24 seven um, settlements. Um, so yeah, this is a little bit about us. We, we, we branded, you know, really gearing towards the young generations and, and the market in Australia is massive. It's up to $25 billion US in 2020. And we see a really strong growth uh, post COVID um, as well. And obviously globally is, is a massive market. So which includes uh, money management, you know, the market of neobanks and obviously instant payments. So yeah, so we've got customers jumping on board, obviously. So we, we sort of like passed the early stage startups. We were now in the early growth stage, which is really exciting. You know, you're, you're just in that sort of uh, journey when you're already bootstrapped the whole business. Now you, that you've got, you know, the product to launch in, 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 in market and you've got customers that jumping on and found your product market fit, which is really important. Um, so yeah, um, alongside we also have the cash rewards uh, system that's gearing towards, again, Gen Zs, like brands like Lego, um, Stacks, uh, we've got, you know, Andrea Moore as well, and obviously um, a few, you know, well-known uh, Australian brands, uh, which is exciting. So we've got competitors here, and obviously, you know, we were comparing us as with a few money management and obviously on the neo bank segment as well. But the way that Clever is different ourselves, differentiates ourselves to the rest of the market is we're not a bank. We, we're not a bank. There was a meme on Twitter. It's quite interesting that banks trying to have Gen Zs but actually they don't know how to do it because they, they are eventually, they're a bank, right? So we are pretty much a, we build a goal and, and content driven platform that works like a bank for, for, for our customers. Um, next slide is pretty much about our team. I'm not sure if I'm like, please moving this. About team. So um, yeah, we are obviously FinTech advocates. We have experience building startups. We have experience um, in, in FinTech industries as well. So that's where, you know, obviously our passion and obviously, the vision that we have this ambition to sort of solve the problems for for our customers here we are thank you very much I'm gonna stop sharing thank you screen. thank you very much caroline yes. um next up is lucas all the way from spain can you run us through in just a couple of minutes what you guys are up to yes thank you everyone for for listening to us and giving us this opportunity to show our project which is stock i don't know if you can see the screen already Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. So Stockfink is a Spanish artificial intelligence startup whose goal is to democratize stock trading through AI. And let me show you what we mean by this through some data. It's interesting to know that above 70% of US stocks are owned by retail investors. And another interesting fact is that uh, above around 70% of trade are executed by algorithms. Another interesting uh, fact is that a lot of these retailers actually lose money on the stock market. And this is caused by a number of reasons. First, there is lack of quality of information. So there is a, available a lot of financial data online, but it's hard to differentiate between the noise and actually the predictive data. There is lack of methodology in the sense that these uh, retail investors are essentially competing against machines and other institutions. 
And then there is lack of financial education. And through Stockfink, we aim to tap into all these root causes in order to counterbalance a little bit this situation. And this is why we have developed a methodology which is based on proprietary AI algorithms, uh, which were designed to help investors and traders make their own unbiased decisions. So namely, we help them by adding more confidence to their decisions. We also discover new opportunities for them on a daily basis. And then we optimize and minimize their time to return. So, so far we have commercialized this uh, platform over the main American, European and Spanish stock exchange exchanges. And the two problems that we solve are first what we call the selection problem. So which are the best opportunities of the day for which we are going to predict every single stock on a given exchange. And then we're going to compare and rank all of these predictions in order to give a list with the 10 best opportunities of the day. And along with that, we give a predicted variability range over the next five days. So as you can see, uh, we provide the current uh, price of the stock compared to our prediction zones for each of the next five days. Uh, right now, we're looking for partners and investors to scale this company. So by commercializing in other markets or across financial in instruments such as crypto, forex, or derivatives. And we're looking to raise at least $500,000. We're also looking for affiliations on the B2C with other fintechs or media platforms uh, in order to target the B2C more efficiently. And then we're also looking to develop the B2B through uh, agreements with other financial institutions such as brokers, banks, or hedge funds. And in the long term, we would also like to launch Stockfink Hedge Fund, uh, for which we have developed more sophisticated algorithms. Cool, nice and nice and short and sweet and succinct. Well done, Lucas. I think it's interesting on your particular one. I think in terms of trends, there's two particular trends there that are very hot. One is obviously AI and algorithmic things. The other one is API-led yeah. products. You know, I think fintech has really entered the world that has you know made made the API famous. It certainly isn't new. It's been around for a long time. But it's it's good to see it's good to see what you guys are doing there. Um, Matthias, are you back with us? Are you ready to talk? Yes, I am. Ah, oh, there you are. Please go for it. Okay. So um, if I if I need to share my screen, uh, someone need to activate the screen sharing. I think. Otherwise, I just do without sharing my screen. It's activated now. Ah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Matthias Leopoldi, so I'm the co-founder of Julia, um, and I'm really happy to be invited to this uh, panel session. Um, so I'll bring you to another continent, um, into, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'll tell you about a kind of revolution that's happening on this continent in the financial inclusion uh, sector. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have living there and um, for the past 10 years there's been a shift in how people um, access financial services um, you have less than 20 percent of the population that has a bank account but you have this thing called mobile money which is uh, paying with your phone that has reached almost you know uh, 60 percent of the population so this is a massive opportunity because it's uh, you know two digit growth every year for uh, for this kind of sector but there is a um, you know, kind of uh, need that is not addressed yet, is the business needs to send to this wallet. So um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the banks don't provide mobile money payments on their online banking platform. So um, this brings a lot of issue for the companies and um, they make 90% of their payment in cash. So when your um, business in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in our core market, which is Ivory Coast, uh, you don't have a way to pay the people that don't have bank accounts, either uh, whether it be, you know, um, workers in some areas like construction, like uh, HR, et cetera, or also uh, to pay your suppliers that are in some sectors like the agricultural sector. So for the companies, it's a real hassle because they, they have people that have these wallets called mobile money wallets, but they cannot pay them on those wallets because it's a, it's not digitally made for the businesses. So what we built is a platform um, where we connect to the telecom operators that are providing these wallets to the consumers. 
and we make a platform for the companies to send from their bank account, the corporate bank account, to those new wallets that are, you know, mobile money wallets. So this looks like a neo bank account. It says, you know, you can uh, reach it through a desktop and a mobile web app. But for the companies, it allows them to, you know, digitize all of their payments. All their payments that were made in cash are now being able to be made digitally on those mobile money wallets. In terms of business model, it's really simple. We take a transaction fee. So it's a, a transaction cut we take when they send, when they top up the wallets. Um, and um, maybe just as we are, you know, speaking about, you know, a panel on, you know, fundraising and uh, how early stage startups in those areas. So in terms of history, we made uh, already two uh, rounds of fundraising. Um, our last round was in July, 2021. And now we are in the phase where we are expanding. So we are opening other countries. Senegal uh, will be open in late October, and then we'll open uh, some new countries in 2022. And then, so the, the ambition of this project is to become the digital African, uh, Pan-African uh, bank for corporates and businesses. Thanks. you. Thank you very much, Matthias. I really appreciate that. Um, and now on the other side of the table, as an investor, um, a venture fund, we've got Martin Tang. Um, can you give us a little, a little bit about what you guys are doing, Martin, from the investor side? Sure. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the, uh, I need to share screen a couple of slides to share. Sure. Have you got access? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Got it. Should do. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Martin. I'm the co-founder and partner of Genesis Alternative Ventures. We are a Singapore-based venture debt fund that invests in fast-growth, high-potential VC-backed startups in Southeast Asia. So that's quite a mouthful. Uh, I used to be an investment banker before I went to the, uh, I used to say dark side, but I say it's the really bright side of things, uh, and the cutting, being able to spend time with uh, some of the world's smartest founders, and uh, being um, getting first looks at the cutting edge types of softwares as, as well as um, technologies that, that are being brewed. Let me just share. So these are some of the companies that we have invested in. We've got about 18 portfolio companies. We invest across sectors, uh, but mainly with debt capital rather than um, venture equity. So we, we, we look across stages series a to late stage we've added a couple of fintech names here um we Pace. can't see the the the, the right ah, screen i think ah I'll sorry just switch to the yeah that's it ah okay thanks martin right okay so a couple so a couple of fintech names here would be pace which is uh buy now pay later which mike talked about um bnpl uh we've got uh, flow, which is a consumer, I'd say it's a it's a it's a consumer uh, a debt collection company. So quite interesting. They use the employ AI, they use a lot of software, um, and uh, to 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 try to coax and gently remind uh, um, people to pay their debts. So they 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 do this service for a lot of the peer to peer lenders, for example. And another one would be trusting social. Very, very interesting company. So they, they write lending algorithms for they let they, they, they write lending algorithms for a lot of uh, and they and they partner with mobile companies as well as banks. So they could do so think about it, they could launch co-branded cards together with the banks and with their differentiated credit approach, they are looking to reduce the number of delinquencies that. Um, we are also a profit with purpose fund. So we focus on a couple of the UN SDGs, um, like decent work and economic growth, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities, just to name a few. And uh, that's really it from, from my side. And I look forward to sharing a little bit more later on. Great. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, Axel, that's, that's it for the people presenting, right? I think Perfect, that was... Yeah. Oh, good. Possibly going to be some else. So let's go into sort of a panel discussion quickly. We've got four people here who've got a lot to offer. And I like the fact that there's quite a spectrum here. We've got 
Um, you know, we've got a founder that's in the throes of trying to raise capital with a really good product. We've got somebody who's raised at least one or two rounds, and then we've got an investor as well. So if there are any questions that come up while I'm asking questions, please do drop them in the chat. And if we've got time, I'll, I'll get to them. So I want to start with you, Lucas. Um, you've built an AI platform. Um, it's right on trend. You know, your, your, your pitch is, is, is very clear. But in two minutes, just really quickly, just just share with us what your experience is so far of raising capital. You're, you're early stage, you're trying to raise half a million dollars. You're clear on what you want to do with that with that money. The capital markets are quite frothy. Just if you if you're open to it, share with us what your experience is so far of trying to raise early stage capital. So far, we haven't tried to to raise it. We have financed the project by ourselves. But yeah, we see that there is, is very receptive to our project because there is like a para, how do you say para, paradigm shift. So we see a lot of uh, potential and is an interest into it, and we are just trying now to to raise the 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 first capital. So talk to me just just very quickly, and and you don't have to. If anything I'm asking you is uncomfortable, you can just say pass. Yeah. But but talk to me about how you're thinking about what kind of money you're going after. You know, you can get good money, you can get bad money, you can get. You know, I saw on Martin's slide, it's sort of entrepreneur friendly you know, resistant to dilution or tries not to dilute the entrepreneur too much. There's really, it's a true story when you hear about good money and bad money. How are you thinking at this early stage about what kind of money you want to go after? What kind of investor? Yeah, so essentially an investor that is going to help us in developing and scaling the company. So uh, with contacts or as we said, we're looking to develop, for example, the B2B. So someone who is also going to be not just an investor, but also a partner. Cool, got it. So strategic investor, somebody who's gonna grow with you and be invested, which is easier yeah. said than done, right? I feel like yeah. we should give a shout out to uh, Carl Goch for doing his spinning training while on the uh, mm -hmm. on, on the FinTech event. That was impressive, Carl, well done. Um, cool, so Caroline, share with us just some of your insights in around getting ready yeah. to raise early stage funding. Um, yeah. particularly in the current capital market. I don't think we've seen capital markets like this in the fintech space before. So just share some insights or experiences about getting ready for that whole process. Absolutely. Um, for my personal experience, um, obviously, um, it's just been um, the last years when obviously when we obviously, you know, try to build our product and launch the product, found the product market fit during that whole process. You have obviously built your own journey and built your own personal brand throughout, you know, the, the entire um, capital raise um, time to sort of like show investors that you actually can do this. So, yeah, my personal experience um, is come in about, you know, obviously, you know, having a product that actually works and having a, a belief in the um, build, build in public because that's all I you know, obviously think it's how you create a momentum and get yourself out as visible as possible, as visible as possible. Because for me, I'm not sure if maybe a debate, but still mode and startup is not a thing for me, but I truly believe in that view in public. And in my experience, finding investor has to be strategic. That investor has to not just, you know, not only just providing us with obviously the capital, but have to also provide us with a lot of advice and connections. Um, in Australia, particularly, um, there's a lot of obviously, in, you know, big funds, capitals for early stage founders to go out and obviously reach out to them, you know, never like early conversation at all. Like if you wanted to build a company tomorrow, definitely reach out to them tomorrow as well on the day that you wanted to build because it takes a long time to build a relationship to the day when you actually receive the check in the in 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 the um for the business so for me um definitely in australia build the um connections build the momentum for your business make it as much visible as possible and then to you know where a certain time where you're always like okay am i i, I am actually certain to have this i need this capital now in my business in in order for it to grow further then that's where you know you already have the whole process behind you and, and on that day, definitely the capital will come in. Um, so that's my experience. Um, for obviously, you know, founder who's, you know, particularly um, uh, first time founder, it's really hard to raise capital. Definitely hard. Like it's, it can't be easy. So for my, like definitely, I'm not a first time founder, but 
my advice is definitely go through accelerator process, uh, accelerator, incubator, if you're a first-time founder, uh, because it's really hard to raise capital if you don't have enough experience or this is just your first venture. Um, unless you're obviously someone who already have, you know, um, you know a lot of people and 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 you can get raise capital but otherwise yeah that's that's basically my experience yeah completely i mean i, I heard a whole bunch of stuff there and, and you know you've, you've got to show traction you've got to show at least yeah if not product market fit because you don't always get product market fit exactly. that early you, you've got to show the route to product market fit um and, and i think you're right in the australian environment which you know i'm you can hear from my accent i'm not australian but i live here but it's, it really is about that network and the people that you've worked with as you've gotten up to them. I don't think that's untrue anywhere else in the world. But if you don't have that network, it just means you've got to have a stronger pitch and you've got right. to have a stronger... Uh, or you have a stronger personal brand or you're like a well-known person. <laughs> Everyone knows yeah. you. So. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Caroline. So, Matthias, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but when I was researching you, um, and you actually shared some of this in your, in your slides, but Crunchbase told me you, you, you raised around $3 million. I think it's slightly less. Uh, what I'm interested though is you seem to be based in France, but you're running an African focused fintech and solving problems in a very different world to a developed country. I'm from Africa. I've spent almost all of my life in, in, in Africa. So it's very different in the European context with, with, with the African context. The fintech landscape in Africa is really exciting. I mean, Yoko has just raised $83 million. You've got some really big companies like Paystack that have had massive success. Um, we work with a lot of these kind of companies. What I'm interested to know from you specifically, Matthias, is give us some insights and experience around raising money from a developed country environment for the African market. You know, that's a whole nother set of complexities. Talk to us about your experience of, of how you raised money. And I could be wrong. Maybe you didn't raise from developed markets. Maybe you raised from Africa for Africa. But I'd love to hear your experience on that early stage, that early raise that you went through. Yeah, thank you, Mike. So, um, yeah, we have um, headquarters in Paris uh, where we have the IT team. But what we actually do is we have an uh, operations office in Abidjan. And I'm mostly all of the time based in Abidjan, but we have a board meeting uh, with some of our investors tomorrow. So that's why I came to Paris, because it's always better to fight with your board in person than <laughs> through Zoom. Nobody, As, nobody fights with their boards. What do you mean? It's, it's, it's everyone's high-fiving at board meetings. Nobody fights. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I would say that, um, so to, to give a, an overview of um, the geography of our investors, we have uh, some of our you know, investors in France, that's true. And that's because uh, our network, our angel network, et cetera, was in France. So that's where we started. But we have investors from Morocco. We have investors from Tunisia. We have investors from uh, um, Nigeria. So it's, a, it's a, and from Mauritius also. Um, so in Africa, I would say that the startups, the, the, the VC landscape is, um, let's say, very nascent. So you have, you have now a lot of VC activity, but it's just, been for the past three years. So before that, the strategy for this, the good startups and that understood the VC game was to say, okay, I will incorporate um, on, in the developed markets and that you have uh, most of the time two you know, geographies. So you incorporate in Europe or you incorporate in the US. So for the Ang Anglophone markets like Nigeria, like Kenya, most of the startups, like you, you're talking about Paystack, but they incorporate in the US to raise the funds. Um, that's because of the you know, investment um, um, landscape and the investment legislation that is not very VC friendly in those markets, even if they don't like most of the time, you don't even understand this kind of asset class. So um, I think it's a bit shifting because I know some of st some startups that incorporate in directly, for example, in Mauritius. Um, but I would say for now, it's still a strategy for the founders there. Even if you're from Africa, like you were born in Africa and you want to raise, you will incorporate outside. And I would say maybe South Africa is an exception because it's, a, it's like a market uh, on itself and it's a bit different. Uh, but yeah, that, that was our experience. And um, the fact is we, we now see that there is a lot of uh, interest from global VC firms towards the African VC landscape, especially in fintech. So you've seen uh, uh, investments in Paystack. They were the, the first generation, but now we ha you have mega rounds, for example, uh, um, let's talk about Wave, the last biggest fundraising. They raised uh, $200 million uh, at the, I don't think it's a 1.7 billion valuation, but 
you have this um, market that's you know being seen as huge even though it's very fragmented because wave originally they were in senegal senegal it's uh, less than 40 million uh, 40 billion dollars gdp and less than 20 million people so when you talk to these two investors they're like okay but they see that there's a lot of synergies and wave and all these kind of startups and maybe july also we are demonstrating that you can launch in very similar market and have a great fintech product uh, in those markets with very high growth. Yeah, thanks Thanks for the shares. And it, it's been my experience working with some of these, con I can't say which ones, but working with some of the ones that you, you've alluded to, it's absolutely what we, we've observed. And I, I don't think it's slowing down. You know, we're now starting to see some of the mega VC names getting very interested in African businesses. So um, really, really interesting what you're doing and, um, you know, making a real difference as well, because those are the communities that I think are really hurt by these things. Um, so that's that's really interesting. Martin, so shifting to the other side of the table, a reminder to everyone, Martin is an investor. So he's the guy that, you know, his, it's his door that everyone else is knocking on to, to give them money. So he's the guy who has to say no to a lot of people. But um, I know you're more focused on later stage companies in, in the growth phase, sort of series A and beyond, maybe even more than series A. So I'm, I'm very aware of that, that you're not particularly positioned to do seed investments and, and, and angel investments and really early stage stuff, but you understand the stuff very well. So, so for the panel and keeping on theme of early stage investments, I guess what I want to ask you is more like sort of advice. So if you're a, if you're a founder looking to raise early capital, whether it's pre-seed, seed, seed um, before you've really hit product market fit, we've heard from some entrepreneurs doing some cool stuff, some founders. What do you think are, it doesn't have to be exactly three, but like when you've got your sort of early stage investor hat on, before there's real proven traction, what, what are the most important things that, that, that these guys and girls should be focusing on to get that early first tranche of money? Right, that, that was quite a pre-loop before the question. So uh, it's true that Genesis looks at slightly later stage companies, but I never say no to speaking with early stage founders, uh, seed stage, pre-seed, angel, whatever the case may be, because for, for us, it's really about um, giving back, giving some advice, mentoring, and also sharing, um, and, and also a bit of scouting to see what's out there. Because today, as a company can be at seed stage, they do well in six months' time, they're raising a 10 million Series A, and that, that's where we want in. Um, so I've done some early stage investing on the personal side. And so, you know, some, I, I think the first thing that everyone needs to realize is that raising money is a sacred task. I'm asking you for a dollar of your money to build my company for the greater good of everyone. So if you think about that, it's a sacred task, then you... you you need to, to be very, very well prepared in your pitch, being well thought through. How you, how, have, you thought of the, have you thought of the issues? Have you thought of contingencies, plan A, plan B? Uh, there, are, there are some founders, when, when I talk to them, they, they share with me a, a deck that is poorly formatted. It tells me something. You can't be bothered to even uh, invest five, 10 minutes in tidying up the slides, making sure there are no typos. Um, and then there are some founders that give me the impression that they, they decided to do a startup because everyone else is doing it. And I woke up this morning feeling I should be a startup founder as well. So mm -hmm. those are some of the, the red flags. And you know, so far I've not been wrong. Um, the, the founders that I, am super impressed by and really, really like are those that, you know, when you ask them for a story and, and they can say like, oh, well, you know, I, I did this because I was helping a friend to solve a problem somewhere else or helping a family member solve a problem. And then suddenly I realized, hey, actually there's a big gap here. It, it, this, this problem um, needs to be solved. And actually I have the network, the connection, the knowledge to solve it. And wow, well, suddenly it's a startup. And uh, I've had the privilege of investing in some of these companies. And those are the kinds of stories when the, the going gets tough, you see the true grit of the founders coming through. Whereas the holiday startup entrepreneurs, at the first sign of trouble, they're closed, they go back to their day jobs. Mm. 
Hundred percent, Martin. I mean, so much. <laughs> you said that with a very cool demeanor, but there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of very deeply packed experience there. And it's, I mean, we see it all the time, right? You call it grit, you call it whatever you want, but you've, you know, people talk about first time founders, but the reason that they talk about first time founders, what they really want to say is, I just want to know that you can get through it when it gets really difficult, because this shit is not easy, right? So it's a nice way of saying, are oh, you a first time founder? What you're really saying is, show to me show that you can actually get over obstacles, show that you've got the grit, show that you're not going to give up. Um, I, I really love that. I know that we're tight on time and I know that the uh, hosts don't want me to go over. So is, is, are there any questions? I haven't seen any questions. I've seen some cool comments, but I don't see any questions. I'm just looking in the chats. Maybe I think if we can ask uh, everyone uh, one quick uh, tip, you know, for uh, other founders in the room or other founders that will uh, listen to the, you've given some obviously, but uh, another cool, uh, good tip that uh, you use during your uh, journey would be uh, would be great as well. Cool. So just from everyone on the panel. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let's go in reverse order. So, <laughs> Martin, give us give us one tip to the aspiring founder. If you were the perfect founder. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I'd say um, being prepared and being very very sincere is absolutely the key. Uh, nothing. Nothing can. Nothing can replace sincerity and integrity as well. Everything else can fail, but you cannot lose your sincerity and integrity. And people can see it. They can smell it. Even over Zoom. Even over Zoom. Absolutely. absolutely. Mateus, what's your, what's your number one tip for the audience to take away? Well, I second Martin on the, on the tip. Um, and I would say from a founder's perspective, especially if you're in a markets uh, where there is no accelerators and no incubation programs where you can find some resources, I would say use um, Twitter to meet other founders that are, you know, in the, in the, in the space. Um, there's a lot of great, great advice. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, fake advice on Twitter, but there's a lot of great advice also. And uh, try to meet some um, other founders and talk about your issues because uh, they are, they will relate to them and you will take a lot of shortcuts. Love it. Lucas, what's your number one tip? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. And also what Martin said about building something that is not just something that is useful to you and then you want to share with everyone else. So I think that's yeah. the key. Of yeah, also. I love what Carl just dropped in the chat here. Have a look there, guys. There's some wise words in the, in the, in the chat on that, same, on that same topic. And Caroline, your number one tip for the, for the people on the, in, on the show. You're on mute. The good old you're on mute. It's got to happen. Good old, um, yeah. Definitely about being obsessed with your problem and therefore you can build a better product. Because once you're obsessed with your problems uh, that you're trying to solve, nothing can beat, the, beat you, right? And, and you find better, better solutions, better product to obviously make the company progress. Um, although I really like the fact that, um, you know, being active on Twitter because uh, that, that's where I, I find, um, you know, um, a lot of, uh, you know, chatting to a lot of amazing uh, people around the world. Uh, so definitely Twitter is the place for you to learn all things fintech, DeFi, Web 3.0, and any other things regarding to blockchain. So yeah, no, it's a great, great tip. Absolutely. And I think it ties in with the authenticity thing, right? Because, you know, Martin's right, you can smell it. And when you have obsession with a problem and trying to solve it, I think investors can find that. The thing I want to leave you with is maybe a bit controversial, but I like dividing a room. And that is that the goal here is not to raise money. That's not the goal. And I think a lot of people get obsessed with raising money. The goal is not to raise money, it's to get traction, it's to scale, it's to solve the problem. And I think we've somehow created this really incorrect narrative in the media to say, you raise money and you're successful. You've raised money and now you've done it. That's not the goal. The goal is traction. And I don't think we celebrate founders that have never raised money, but been very successful enough. We work with some clients who are incredibly successful and they've never raised a dime because they've, they've, they've managed to do it without it. Now, I'm not saying that capital is a bad thing. Sometimes you need it to scale, but I think we need to shift that narrative a bit to the goal is traction and growth. Right. The goal is not to raise money. Um, and it's very much in line with what everyone was saying. I think we're I out totally of time. I totally agree. And uh, the best example uh, recently was uh, MailChimp, obviously, that sold to Intuit, apparently wow. with no major funding and it sold yeah. for. 12 yeah. or something billion. So you know, like Theranos. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not go down Theranos. We don't have enough time for me to bitch and moan about that. 
Yeah, but that's another. Thank topic. you very much to the panelists. That was super cool. Um, you you know all of our names: Caroline from Clever, Lucas from Stockfink, Mateus from Julia, Martin from Genesis Ventures, and I'm Mike from Learner Digital. If you want to reach any of us, sounds like some people are very active on Twitter. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, it's been great. Thanks, Axel and the team for putting this on. And I think Thanks, that's been done. Thanks everyone. Thanks for uh, thank you for that. And basically, yes, so now you. we'll uh, we'll move to the um, to the breakout room. So. Uh, uh, stay here again for 10-15 uh, minutes uh, you can scan this QR code everyone is used not to scanning QR code so I guess you know how to do it uh, to join the community so uh, startup and angels uh, once again I think that's uh, one of the other tips connect with as many people as you can uh, pitch your story uh, speak about it uh, etc that's the best thing to do as well and join us tomorrow as well for our uh, third day uh, more about uh, scale up stories uh, pierre uh, here will uh, uh, manage the, the discussion with uh, some really amazing uh, people from uh, air Wallex, uh, an amazing uh, australian scale up uh, story agri digital better trade-off xero uh, and uh, my co-founder leo um, and we, you'll be so redirected into uh, some breakout rooms with uh, some uh, random people from the from today's uh, audience. So uh, feel free to uh, connect, introduce yourself quickly, and, uh, and exchange uh, contact. Thanks again for uh, joining today, and uh, see you soon in uh, uh, on other events online or uh, physically. Today, we live in an exciting data revolution where technology is rapidly changing the way we work and live. At OVH Cloud, we are at the forefront of this digital shift as a leading global cloud provider and the number one cloud solution in Europe, serving customers worldwide. We are independent and vertically integrated with our data centers across our own fiber optic network bringing businesses everywhere a secure and efficient alternative to the other cloud hyperscalers with complete respect for data protection. And just how are we different from the tech giants? Here are four key advantages. Our history is grounded in developing innovative efficiencies with a clear vision for a more sustainable future. We own the full value chain and we manage the product lifecycle. With our vibrant ecosystem of partners, customers, and our common goals, we offer a complete portfolio of cloud solutions in total compliance to industry and open source standards. And as an ecosystem, we are driven by purpose, united by common product values. Together, we are change makers. Building the future of technology for all 